Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Technology has come up and has changed in beautiful ways, but what remains is the desire to tell stories and the need to tell stories and the skill and the challenge that storytelling requires. People who are called to documentary take heart, you know, take it seriously, because few are called and it's an important journey and it's an important thing to do with one's life. Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Documentary Life. I'm your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. As always, I am honored and thankful to have both your ears and energy with me today. This week, you're listening to one of our monthly conversations with a documentary industry person. What you'll be listening to also happens to be one of my favorite episodes so far. In terms of conversation and content, it's actually probably the closest to what the intent of this program is all about. You'll be listening to a pretty candid yet very thoughtful conversation with someone who not only makes documentaries for a living, but who also runs a well-established nonprofit organization that educates and inspires others to make their own documentary films. Sounds familiar, right? Up our alley. Today's guest's name is Ian McCluskey. If you've lived in the Pacific Northwest, you've probably heard about his work, taken one of his organization's workshops, or seen one of his films. If not, well, I'd like to take a moment to sing Ian's praises by reading his bio, which comes directly from the Northwest Documentary website. It reads, Ian McCluskey is an award-winning documentary film director and the founding director of Northwest Documentary. His work has garnered more than a dozen prestigious awards, including four Emmys, and has been featured in international film festivals including Tribeca, London, and Clermont-Ferrand. His work has been broadcast in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. His films have also screened in major museums such as the Boston Museum of Fine Art and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. He studied journalism at the University of Oregon and creative writing at the University of Montana and Colorado College. After working for Oregon Public Broadcasting, McCluskey founded Northwest Documentary to devote his life to telling untold stories and to mentor others to tell their stories. Using today's digital technology and borrowing from the traditions of photography, literary nonfiction, and documentary, his work reflects the people, place, and personality of his native Northwest. So yeah, sounds like a pretty awesome dude, right? So I'm extremely excited to share with you the conversation that I recently had with Ian McCluskey. Enjoy. Ian, thanks for agreeing to come on the show today. I'm very much looking forward to, to having some discussions. Thanks for having me. So, I mean, first things first, as I mentioned, we're in a new location. Uh, Northwest Documentary is located in some different, uh, some different digs, some different areas. Tell us about that and how that came to be. Well, we've been looking for a long time for a permanent headquarters. We were uh, originally started as a volunteer group, uh, me and a group of friends kind of gathered around and our first location wasn't a location at all it was my living room and front porch and we decided that yeah. we wanted to tell stories and to help other people tell their stories then we moved to a borrowed office space in the old town chinatown district of portland which we loved but as we grew we began to outgrow it grow it and uh, yeah dreamed one day that we would have sort of a real center a real place to call home and uh, Portland has never had a documentary center before. No place uh, really where documentary filmmakers could gather, edit their work, show their work, and form a community. And for the kind of the very first time, we have this 3,000 square foot warehouse. It, it was a blank 
a big blank box and we've now have a gallery where we can display photography. We have an edit suite or edit studio where people can edit work. We have a loft where independent filmmakers and independent artists can conduct their work uh, and a screening area with old vintage historic theater seats where we can showcase work and already I, right behind me we can see that they're old 1926 uh chairs from the original hollywood theater in portland oregon and now they have a second life here at northwest documentary that's so appropriate and uh young and old come here and sit in the seats uh, where generations literally generations have sat before watching and being inspired by movies and now they can sit and dream up their own films and their own stories to tell. Well, it's beautiful. Um, Location-wise, you feel like this is the place that you were thinking about. You're dreaming of this on your couch back at your place years ago. Years ago, it um, that was 2003. Yeah. So it was, it was uh, the Wild West of a new golden era of documentary. Yeah. It, it literally was the, the uh, very dawn of um, digital documentary with new mini DV cameras and uh, G3 and G4 Mac towers yeah, running totally. <laughs> uh, the very first digital software to edit, you know, yeah. the original Avid and the original Final Cut Pro. So absolutely, absolutely. Were brand, brand new in those years. And it seemed like for the very first time, it became uh, economically accessible yeah. that someone could tell their own story for the first time. It's so funny that you say that because, you know, Sitting here listening to you talk about it in that way, I think, oh, that's right. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I, we, I wasn't doing this, uh, you know, 12, 15 years ago in the way that we're doing it now. The accessibility wasn't there. I feel like now it's, it's almost as if I've, I feel like I've taken it for granted. And, and I think about sort of the generation prior to us now. This is what they grew up in. Like this was, this is give, not, not given to them, but they, they, they have sort of been born into this. Whereas you and I lived in a time where we were working on, you know, linear machines and, and things of that nature. <laughs> Remember those days, the three quarter inch tape days? Technological dinosaurs. It's uh, yeah. hard to imagine that it was uh, within a lifetime that things have changed so it much. It is hard to imagine. And, and now it just feels like, yeah, I've always been doing this. And it's, that's not the case for us at all. Right. Um, I think the yeah, uh, please the technology has come up and has changed in beautiful ways, but what remains is the desire to tell stories and the need to tell stories and the skill and the challenge that storytelling requires. And so these things have been present in the human experience since the dawn of time, mm. since anyone can remember, and we have just in, been passed down that uh, need, that human, biological, uh, spiritual, you know, intellectual and uh, community need to tell the stories of ourselves and the stories of each other. And now we just have the opportunity to use very, very powerful tools to express that art. Do you consider, do you yourself, do you consider yourself first and foremost a storyteller or do you consider yourself a filmmaker or do you consider yourself an explorer? What, um, and, and maybe you don't define yourself at all by those words, but you know, when somebody asks, what do you do, Ian? How do you describe that? I think that's an excellent question because I have some, you know, very good friends who are now fairly established um, and fairly successful filmmakers, and they work with uh, groups like National Geographic or the North Face or Patagonia. But they consider themselves first and foremost sort of explorers and um, you know expeditionaries, and they just happen to be documenting their life. Um, I know I have some very good friends who are filmmakers who grew up with a love of cinema, went to formal film school, mm. and consider themselves, you know, filmmakers with the capital F. And <laughs> what they strive for is to express themselves and push forward the the art form of cinema or of film, uh, you know, uppercase F film. Yeah, I consider myself um, a storyteller. Yeah. and that I just happened to stumble upon the technology at the right time in the right place that allowed me to tell the stories, I think, as three-dimensionally as I could. But my background was in writing, creative writing, in which I switched into nonfiction writing because I found out that I couldn't make up, even in my best attempts at creativity and imagination, 
I couldn't make up things that were more bizarre and more <laughs> beautiful and more haunting and more poignant than the actual reality of the human experience. <laughs> Spoken like a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> and when I, when that, the real world became so fascinating and yeah. so curious to me, I began to write, um, write in the nonfiction g- genre, you know, yeah. essay and, and reportage and profile. And then when it became possible to, actually record that with cameras and then edit it and then add some music and add historic archive. I was like, Oh, well this is the trifecta of, of all the things that I love. I never really, I don't think I ever fully intended to, to follow this path, but I just just kept going on it and going on it. And like, um, you know, like a wonderful set of, um, choices in life you know Hmm. the robert the poet robert frost said the you know how way leads on to way um i just keep taking this this path and it's it presents itself project by project with new ways to explore the world and new experiences to have and um it's you wake up one morning and it's like oh wow a decade just passed yeah something that you have you always have this in your back pocket really is a foundation now you have this foundation which you have built you and obviously countless people along the way Mm -hmm. have built with northwest documentary so let's focus on that for a second and tell me back in 2003 when Mm -hmm. you were having these sort of couch discussions or maybe they were before 2003 um when who was involved and, and how did you start talking about there needs to be a place that does this? And what was it that it needed to be? And is it, is it the sort of the same mission that we have now? That's, yeah, that's an excellent question. To, to, to really go back in time, I was a, at the University of Oregon, a new graduate student, and I was looking for a class um, that I was signed up for. I think it was interviewing technique, but I stumbled across a documentary filmmaking class by accident. And it was the first day of term, and I was lost in the journalism building, and there was a group of kids setting up three-point lighting, yeah. which any documentary filmmakers familiar with the term, I wasn't at the time. I had yeah. no idea what three-point lighting was. I had only watched documentaries on television yeah and so I knew what they looked like but I didn't know the the curtain the magic curtain hadn't been, hadn't pulled, been pulled back yet, yeah. and so for the very first time I stumbled into a studio and saw the curtains literally sort of very literally pulled back yeah. and all the cords on the floor all the microphones all the the shotgun mic and the on the boom pole and the the big key light and the bounce and the <laughs> yeah. and the you know edge light or the backlight and the person sitting there and then the person's face framed up three quarter profile on the monitor and I like it it something yeah clicked and I said oh my god that's amazing and then just then the instructor walks in with a clipboard and says sit down you know class will begin and the students started one by one pitching projects little did I know that they were wow senior media majors who had been thinking for over a year of their capstone graduating documentary project. (laughs) So they had their pitches very well developed. Oh, wow. I improvised one on the spot. No way. (laughs) Which was, uh, it just sort of came to me, which was the story of Celilo Falls, which was a, at the time, it was, it was like the Niagara Falls of the Pacific Northwest, the largest waterfall on the largest river of the Northwest. And yeah. it was for millennial, millennium, the gathering point of native peoples uh, every spring and fall when the salmon ran. And it was a critically, culturally important heart of the Northwest. And even for non-natives, uh, people like my father would go and stop. And, it, you know, it was, it was as key to the Northwest as a mountain range. And um, in 1957, uh, the construction of a dam inundated it and drowned it. And I pitched that idea that there's photos of this place. There's the place itself still exists, but is silent. There's photos of what it used to look like. And there's my generation that knows it in memory and the memory of what's been passed down. And there's a generation that experienced it. And so I want to interview both those generations and create a homage to a place that is there but isn't there 
and for some reason the teacher actually liked that pitch yeah and um i had begun the journey i didn't even know i had begun the journey but it yeah. started with a curiosity and a desire to explore and what i didn't realize at the very moment was that that was going to lead me to knock on the doors of total strangers people of not of my age not of my cultural background uh, people who had been historically injured and exploited in the past and to then earn their trust mm. and to celebrate with them and to participate in ceremony with them and to go do sweat lodge blessings for the project and my life was enriched um, tenfold by this experience in the process I was trying to give back to them a story that they had, had been sort of taken from them and um, to reconnect history and to share the story with the larger Oregon and Northwest population. I didn't realize all of those themes were happening all at once, but that was what ended up happening, which profoundly changed my life. And when I finished that film, I began working for Oregon Public Broadcasting and opened the door to that. And then I made films or I guess documentaries for television. But the one thing that um, stuck with me was, you know, I had gotten the job, I was in a professional position, and I was with career editors, career shooters. Um, it was fairly well funded as a PBS station. But what I missed was sort of the ragged DIY um, community aspect of documentary filmmaking and the idea that just anyone like myself who had never picked up a camera before could pick up a camera. Yeah. And that's why and when and how Northwest Documentary began was the idea that it documentary isn't just, I mean, it is, for, it is done by professionals, but it doesn't just have to be done by professionals, that really anyone can grab a, a camera. And in 10 weeks or so, in the time that I took in a, in a college term to make a film, other people can do the same thing. And so we created a program at Northwest Documentary, sort of loosely based on this progression that had changed right. my life because I wanted to offer that to other people so it could change their life. Incredible. One of the things that I've always sort of been drawn to is that idea about the idea of real stories and there needs to be people that are telling those stories. There are enough media outlets, there are enough Hollywood films that are out there that this sort of necessi necessity to be able to tell to be able to tell stories in the where that they're actually happening or as close as we can get to that because as we both know no story is ever without bias to some extent it just has always spoken to me in not only the kinds of films that I like but what I aspire to create myself I believe that you guys are doing that wholeheartedly I've known a number of students that have come through some of your workshops I've obviously seen the work that you do and it's exciting to know that there are people out there that are that are telling stories that are directly affected by the work that you and your organization do. It's in many ways it's 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 my um, my hopes, my endeavors to be able to to create that sort of good feeling and goodwill sort of through what we're doing here with the podcast, which yeah. is again inspiring and educating people to tell these stories and to also find a way to be able to live and live well doing that. Mm -hmm. making films, telling these stories. Yeah. And you, in essence, are leading a documentary life um, in many ways that we talk of leading a documentary life on this show. Maybe you can help, um, and this is happening throughout the discussion today anyhow, even if it doesn't happen directly sort of with this particular question, but how would you say that you are leading a documentary life? Yeah, I think every day is a documentary life here at Northwest Documentary because every single day is engaged with the telling of stories. And we make our own films, documentary films that we're, uh, I make my own documentary films that are spearheading uh, questions that I'm asking in my life about the meaning of life, the meaning of community, the history that, I, that hasn't been written into history books that I want to discover and uncover and then share and we tell help tell other nonprofits tell their stories um, nonprofits that are doing amazing work in the community but um, you know their background isn't in documentary films so we bring our tools and background to help 
their voices get heard. And then the people who walk through the front door and sign up for workshops, we help them tell their stories. So on any given day, there's computers up with edit uh, stories in the middle of edit. Yeah. There's people talking about stories. There's um, classes in the evening. So it's we're surrounded by um, the documentary. We're immersed in the documentary life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And how much would you say, Ian, how much time is spent, and this may change project to project, but generally, how much time is spent with you actually being here, working either with students that are here, or volunteers, or, I don't know, uh, building a bathroom, or the seating for the, you know, for the, uh, um, the projection room, if you will, or projection mm -hmm. area. Uh, how much time is spent doing that for you versus working on your own film? Oh, that's a good question. I am probably 75 to 80 percent is spent in the general work of Northwest Documentary, and maybe only 20 percent is done on the um, on specifically my own projects. Yeah. And by my own projects, I don't even really even mean that they're my own solo projects. I mean one of the things that as a nonprofit, which we exist to do, is to create um, large projects that otherwise wouldn't be able to be produced, um, either because they're not glitzy and glamoury or you know entertaining enough and going to sell enough tickets for Hollywood, yeah. or because a solo individual um, filmmaker maybe can't, as an individual, raise the the money or the resources to tell them. So as a nonprofit. We, we act a little bit more like, say, a theater group or a dance troupe or a symphony where I sort of serve more like an artistic director that yeah. says, okay, we're going to mount this play or we're going to mount this ballet with my love and passion and background in this art form. I will be take on a leadership role. However, we still are going to hire and involve you know, volunteers and interns and shooters and editors and musicians and graphic designers and audio engineers and yeah. a whole, you know, sometimes up to 80 people. And with the, um, the nonprofit status and also with our track record of um, successfully managing projects, of delivering what we promise, we have earned the trust of foundations yeah. and, um, you know, humanities councils. Uh, our last film was, you know, we helped get funding through um, not just individuals like a Kickstarter, but we also received funding from like the Wyoming Humanities Council, the Utah Humanities Council, the National Utah, Endowment for and Humanities. The National Endowment for the Humanities. We were also funded um, occasionally by the Endow National Endowment for the Arts for our work. Um, and it's because of this sort of idea that we're all contributing together and it's not just Ian McCluskey Productions right. doing Ian McCluskey vanity or passion projects, that we are right. telling stories that matter both to the American West but also to the nation and that we're trying to, that's like a litmus test, is are the projects we're telling, can they be shown coast to coast, can they be shown internationally, can they be shown in a classroom, are they exploring uh, something significant? Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'm just help them be sort of like a ringleader or a, a conduit or a conductor to the orchestra. Just out of my own personal experience, there's a moment in a documentary filmmaker's life, speaking of the documentary filmmaking life, there's yeah. usually a, 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 a really critical moment, I think, in the career of a documentary filmmaker, and that is usually comes in the form of their second or third project. Like the first one or the second one is almost always funded out of pocket and it's almost always funded uh, by them and their friends and they've beg borrowed and steal, stole yeah. everything or they've shot something that's already so close to them, maybe a story of a family member or something they're already involved in. And so they can pull it off either for free or out of their own pocket right? and eat the cost. And that's beautiful, and a lot of beautiful films get made that way. And then there's a point maybe way down the line where maybe they're Barbara Koppel or, <laughs> you know, D.A. Pennebaker yeah. or, you know, a well-known name where um, people are paying them money to sure. 
make films, but there's this like maybe the third or fourth project where they're like ambitious enough that they need money to fly somewhere. They need gas money. <laughs> they need and desire to rent or buy a slightly better camera yeah. or to hire an editor that's a better editor than they are. Right. And it's that stretch moment. And that's particularly uh, poignant to me. And I would love to set up sort of an emerging documentary filmmaking grant that uh, could fill up someone's tank of gas or give them that plane ticket to go get that critical story that otherwise they just couldn't do. I feel like for people like some of my listeners or certainly people here in the Portland, Oregon area, meeting someone like yourself, um, getting involved with Northwest Documentary can, can perhaps um, open some avenues, um, not only, of course, in the obvious ways of creativity and learning how to put stories together, but maybe in a way of how to, um, how to lead sort of a documentary life, which then leads me to what you are doing here with Northwest Documentary. I know that I have a number of listeners um, who would certainly be interested in, in say, for instance, um, Sam, somebody from Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah. And I want to start a, a NODAC documentary similar to North, what you're doing here with Northwest Documentary. How does that person in Fargo, North Dakota, how do they begin and start the process of building what you have done here? How does that happen? What's the next step after that college conversation? <laughs> what a great question. No one's ever asked me that. <laughs> the thing that I would encourage everyone to do, and the, the, the only thing that's, the one thing that's worked for me, probably 99% of my, this is like the one magic ingredient that's probably 99% of my documentary career, is enthusiasm. And I get really passionate about something and really enthusiastic and enthusiasm is contagious. Yeah. So I would encourage anyone to find something, a story, an idea, a topic that they're really, truly passionate, like genuinely passionate about and start telling people the story and asking for help and, and, um, opening themselves up to gaining help and collaboration and it will come. It, doors will oh, open, yeah. people will show up, and often people in the most unexpected and beautiful ways, you know, people who speak that foreign language that you don't speak, yeah, so right. a musician who plays the instrument that's just perfect for your soundtrack. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, <laughs> the book author who, or the historian who actually is an expert in this field, right. or the, you know, elderly woman who says, oh, I have a whole shoebox full of photos of that. Of and course. then the next thing you know, it's... The, the world has shifted. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's wonderful and inspiring advice for those of us um, who want to make a film. If someone wants to start an organization similar mm-hmm. to your own in a practical sense, what are the first couple of, of steps one should take to do that? <laughs> He's like, Chris is really trying to pin me down to the. Well, <laughs> He's, I just, I, I mean, cause, cause the way I see it, Ian is, is your, um, not that you're the gatekeeper. There's a better expression for it, a better phrase, but you have the insight and knowledge from experience. If nothing else, like you've done it. So maybe you can draw from your experiences in that first year or two, how did you start setting this up as an organization? Mm-hmm. Well, I think I often joke that, um, like anything in life, uh, it started with optimism and ignorance. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and had I known what I know now, I probably might never have <laughs> taken this on. I, um, <laughs> I was a, a kid who grew up, um, like pretty much most people of my generation who grew up with, you know, the four, the four channels, there was the three network channels and then when Fox came and, about, and or, then there or, was, or and then there was public broadcasting. Okay, yeah, so yeah. there was ABC, NBC, CBS, yeah, and, and then there was PBS. Exactly, and PBS. so there's four channels. Only one of them showed documentaries yeah, but grew, and Dr. Who and grow up with the educational <laughs> TV and, um, and the PBS model of course is, is like the pledge drives. They're like, oh, give us your yeah. support yeah. Uh, if you value programming like this. And I took that to heart. You and um, 
I was like, oh, well, how hard can it be to start a nonprofit? Because, no like, once you start a nonprofit, people will, like, donate. As your phone <laughs> rings. We have a caller right, right now, actually. <laughs> Viewers <laughs> like you. Um, I think, I guess, to just back up and say that more yeah. clearly, I didn't realize how hard it was to write grants. I didn't realize how much organization goes into a nonprofit organization. I didn't realize... Um, how much infrastructure, how much accounting, how much yeah. <laughs> uh, basically foundational work. It's taken us a dozen, it's taken me and the team here 12 years just to get to the, the level where we're, you know, still barely scratching by. It is wow. every single day, um, you know, our budgets are incredibly lean. Yeah. And um, it's it's not lucrative at all. It's, it's very DIY. It's very... Um, you know, you've got to be super resourceful, but, um, so it's not easy, but I would encourage people to, um, to draw on the strengths of documentary, which is what we've done, which is, um, build partnerships, yeah. gather in-kind support as much as possible, um, build a volunteer base and invite people to be part of the process. Uh, create a center or a meeting point um, for the first 10 years it was right. you know donated space um, how did you first get the word out initially to let people know that Northwest documentary existed you know this is somewhat the early days of the internet mm -hmm. right and certainly social media mm -hmm. um, so how were you getting the word out um, about your workshops and about so you can start networking, collaborating with people, and then helping them, you know, facilitating them being able to do the same thing. How yeah. did you first get that going? The original primary way was Craigslist. That was before Craigslist was oh, sort of cluttered of up. It was actually a fairly well, yeah. well resourced, or not resourced, but a, a, a well used. Um, well, it was a well used resource. Resource yeah, to the yeah. community, so people would go and look for that. Um, I think yeah. flyers and and community flyers. boards wow. uh, right? is very old, <laughs> but um, <laughs> very hands on. But it's always been very word, of, yeah, very DIY. Very, it's been word of mouth. Yeah, really. Yeah, um, we we have never had a big advertising budget, so it's word of mouth. It's people who have taken the workshop, um, and then we have public screenings of the films that get made. Right, and that uh, allows the community to come and participate in these stories and then hopefully the goal of course is that they not only celebrate the finished product of film but then they see that it's the cycle it's the life cycle that is always starting over with each completed film a new one needs to begin and they yeah, say oh yeah. i could make another one i could right right i, I could make my another one with my friend or i could make one with of this story or someone in the community is like oh that film about a grandmother with alzheimer's inspires me to talk to my father who has pancreatic cancer and get his story, you yeah. know. One of the things that we have done that has made us, um, allowed us to be successful is to really look at um, partnerships. And so we offered like two camps, summer camps with kids to do filmmaking. But the way that we do it is we partnered with the Oregon Museum of Science, okay. who has put on kids science camps for 50 years. And yeah. so they have the yellow school buses. They have counselors trained with CPA. They have uh, registration. They have all the accreditation, the insurance. Um, and so we approach them and we create partnerships and we say, hey, we've got cameras, tripods and microphones and filmmakers who love filmmaking. Yeah. We want to teach kids science through the the art of documentary yeah and they say great we've got counselors and school buses and bunk beds and yeah and you're like oh really that's and a great. cook <laughs> and so it creates a sort of a win-win alignment yeah. of mission and so that's the whole idea of like true partnerships for true partnerships yeah. and and what is so beautiful about documentary is the term documentary is in, is, is as broad as life itself. And so therefore, if someone is really passionate about the stories of elders, potentially they could create a partnership and program with a retirement home. If they're really impassioned about uh, food security, food justice, there are nonprofits in their community that are probably on the ground working yeah. on this. And so I encourage people, um, I don't encourage people to start their own nonprofits because it's a headache. It's expensive. It's, it's really um, maybe even daunting or prohibitive to start your own nonprofit, I encourage them to find a nonprofit who's already doing the 
the work in the field they want mm. to be doing and then team up with them. with them. And in Portland, I believe in Oregon, there are approximately 10,000 nonprofits. Yeah. And in the city of Portland, Oregon, I believe there's three to 4,000 nonprofits. So yeah. just that That's alone, personal. it's whatever you're passionate in, in, there's probably a nonprofit. Somebody that you can partner up that with. That you can partner with. You can, they can help you write the grants. They can help uh, with the resources, the community connections. Yeah. They've got the website. They've got the listserv. They probably even have the venue. And so um, I guess you, the secret you, is yeah. don't reinvent the wheel. Okay. Okay. Uh, be independent and be be you know uh, autonomous but don't, but that's if you're truly independent and autonomous you're in probably the wrong art form <laughs> you know absolutely. You're, absolutely you're probably in the wrong genre um yeah be a poet or an animator or right. something which right. is beautiful and glorious but if you're a documentary filmmaker by key, nature we're by nature we rely on, on partnership and, and collaboration yeah. so find find others who are doing the work that you want to be doing let's talk about the current project sure voyagers without trace mm -hmm. let's talk talk about that a little bit all right voyagers without trace is a historic search or it's a search for a historic story so it's part adventure story part sort of historic quest or treasure hunt and it started uh years ago when i was in a remote corner of wyoming and i came across one of those historic roadside markers that probably any of the listeners have probably seen a dozen times that say, you know, this happened here a long time ago, yeah. and there's a black and white little sepia uh, tinted photo of an old historic, you know, usually a, a miner or something with a long beard. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, this is in 1846, uh, Joseph Jeremiah Johnson uh, got his mule stuck here. Here, in the yeah. <laughs> and, um, and one, one of those signs that I came across by accident had this picture of three very good looking, yeah. pe almost look like movie stars from yep. the 1930s. And uh, two, uh, two gentlemen and a really beautiful um, young woman. And it said that here, you know, three people from Paris, France came to the American West. Uh, two of them were on their honeymoon and the third was their best friend. And they had uh, kayaks and cameras and beer and they made a historic first kayak descent of the green and Colorado River in the midst of the Great Depression on the eve of World War II. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, what a romantic adventure. <laughs> what? And at the time I was traveling alone by myself and I was maybe a little lonely and a little bored and I was like, "Oh my god, this is beautiful." Yeah. Like I want to be, you know, I wanted to like go on the trip with these guys. I yeah. want a oh, time yeah. machine and go hang out with three Parisians, drinking beer, making a movie, um, kayaking through the America, the wild American West at yeah. a time when it was all wilderness and there were no dams. And I was like, what a, what an amazing life experience. And, uh, years passed. And at the time I found the sign, I wasn't a documentary filmmaker actually. Oh, you saw this. A, you came I across saw this, this a, a while ago. While I was uh, a graduate student in writing and journalism. No way. So you just remembered this. But I remembered it. And I only remembered like three details. 1938, kayaks, French people. Yeah. Like Utah. <laughs> and um, a dozen years passed. I had no idea at the time that I would ever be a documentary filmmaker. Yeah. There was no ambition. There was no career objective to be a filmmaker. But I was curious which is, you know, I think 90% of what makes documentarians documentarians. Yeah, yeah. And um, the other 10% is maybe optimism and stubbornness. <laughs> stubbornness, definitely. <laughs> I fight for the optimism, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe just stubbornness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, th the seed was planted, and I reached a point um, in my life where... I had just turned 40 and had found myself maybe surrounded in, unintentionally by um, what I was good at in life and what was comfortable mm -hmm. and that I maybe hadn't been pushing my boundaries of comfort like I had as a youth and maybe hadn't gone on a great adventure in recent years yeah. and was starting to feel a little complacent and a little yearning for 
adventure and the memory percolated back up of two young, good looking newlyweds and their best friend having the inspiration to travel across halfway across the world to do something no one had done before. And I was like, that is so inspiring. I'm going to try to dig up more information. And I searched online as much as I could and there was no information on them Yeah. other than it said the woman Genevieve was the first woman to take her own boat down the Colorado River. And I was like, well, that's inspiring, but there's not a lot of information. Yeah. And there was a historic uh, article had been written about this in the historical quarterly of Utah back in 1986, pre-digital. And, yeah. and so I called the so University of like Utah. Exactly. Yeah. I called the University of Utah, the, just the general librarian number, like hoping to get a librarian who could maybe look up the call number for me, maybe look up the microfiche, yeah. maybe figure out if I could pay them couple dollars to make a photocopy Copy of, of this microfiche and then like yeah. mail me or scan me and then email me this article and that would be like at least some a crumb of information yep. turns out I call the guy who answers the phone is the guy who wrote the article right. and the guy who put that sign there yeah 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 <laughs> which 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 you, you like, explain in the film that's right and that began this journey and yeah. he said oh yeah I've got I don't have very much information but I have like three or four photos of these guys. And I know there's a diary that still exists. Um, and I know that there's color film. And I was like, wait, what? You're like, wait, I'm sorry. Wait, what did you say? He's like, there's not just, they not only film themselves, but they film their own adventure in color. Yeah. So they were, they were using state of the art equipment. State that of the art equipment. Used. And so as a documentary filmmaker, I'm like, are you kidding yeah. me? Film was expensive. It was the great depression. <laughs> You know, film wasn't like, it's like GoPros. The last thing you know, you ex- it's you the expect to come last across. thing I would expect. And this archivist said, "Yeah, there, there's uh, color footage that exists." Did he know where that footage was? He had an old bootleg dub, you know, transferred from Umatic to Beta to VHS, no back up to like Beta, back down to VHS, and he had a copy of it. It was really poor quality, sure. but it offered a little glimpse. And he said, "I think the original exists back in France." Yeah, yeah. And that sent me on basically that search, that treasure hunt to go find it and to uncover the original 16 millimeter color footage and as well learn how to kayak so that I could go down the river in search of the story. (laughs) With Voyagers and with the story, what I hope to say is like, this is the adventure for the average person. This is adventures that that everyday and people yet clearly not not average at all right right but, yeah but i get your point that ordinary people can have extraordinary yeah. adventure yeah exactly and that having a willingness and a courage to pursue a story or to pursue an adventure opens up one's life to that and so i eventually decided the only way to really truly understand the story was to enter into the world of the river itself. And the only way to go down the river was to go actually down the whitewater. And the only way to go down the whitewater is like, well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well get in a kayak. And well, I don't know how to kayak, yeah. but if I learn how to kayak, I might feel the same things they felt. I might be just as scared. I might be just as sore and tired. And then when I, on day 20, looking up at the stars, I might feel the same oh, reverie yeah. and the same release and the same connection to the, to the canyons. And I think that your subjects were 80 years prior. Or exactly, and that that's the, that's the true message of the film is that the canyons and the wilderness are still there, and what is important is people connecting to them, and that by connecting to them, we can still have those experiences. And as long as there are wild places and the stars above, people generations after me can keep having that, and that it's important to connect to nature that way and to have to connect to adventure, to connect to the human soul. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, if I'm being honest, I, I would I would say that a, a big part of the attraction for that film to me, as I was watching it, um, was that you were you were doing in in many ways, in essence, why I do documentary films, which is not only the curiosity aspect, not only telling people stories, but experiencing it. Like you're. You, what you did is the ultimate for me in terms of not only are you telling someone's story, but you're 
ex- you're having experience yourself. Like you've immersed yourself sort of in the process. Yeah. And, and that's that. That's what I've always geeked out on films. Um, when I dreamed of being a, a narrative director or, or director of narrative films, you know, one of the guys, one of the filmmakers whose works I really glommed on to was Lars von Trier back when I really liked his work and a big part of what he was all about. You know, here's this Danish filmmaker in the 90s as a big part of the dogma film movement. And so he was all about process and immersing yourself in it. And that almost became more exciting to me than the film Mm -hmm. itself. Like the process of it is such an exciting thing to me. And it always has been. And in Voyagers, you're living, you're living that adventure and you're a part of the process. So you're making a film, but process has really become a part of that. Let's talk, um, because I feel like we, we have to, and you probably get asked these sorts of questions all the time, um, but I think I know that I, I, that there's going to be a number of people who want to know this sort of information. A lot of us geek out on it. <laughs> Technically and logistically, when you're filming down in a place like that where you know you're going to be on the river for 900 miles and there's only two towns, what are you guys doing for equipment? We, um, we big, borrowed, and stole a big arsenal of equipment yeah um, and I'm specifically talking about camera gear of course, yeah in this case we um, we had to location shooting of course is hard so we had to make sure everything was waterproofed so we had a lot of pelican cases yeah. we had um, tripods we had uh, arsenal of pretty much any DSLR we could get our hands on okay um, the from ex- the 1dx to the 60D, you know, yeah. all the, the whole range of the Canon family. Yeah. Uh, were you using the 1DX for the time lapse? Mm, we were, okay. yeah. Yeah. And, and some principal shooting. Okay. Um, we had some tripods. We had a slider that ended up not getting used too much because it was, you know, we had to pack everything oh, and yeah. keep it strapped down for the rapids. And yeah. we had a jib we used. And for one week on the river, we had a team from Oregon, uh, ATI, they actually build their own drones right. and fly their own drones. So right. I saw that we made a um, an agreement with them to join the t- the trip for a week. Yep, and they came down and got some great uh, aerial photography. Oh, yeah, of course, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm remiss that I didn't see it in the theater. Like that's I would I want to see this film in the theater. <laughs> it's pretty breathtaking in the theater because yeah. of the scale of the you know Canyonlands National well, Park and, yeah. and the American West to see it from an aerial perspective yeah. is pretty yeah. amazing. And, and it is, and even just the cameras down in the can, canyons on the water. Um, technically, how were you guys managing that? Uh, were Ben and John on boats? Like, tell us how that was happening. Yeah, we had three kayaks and then uh, one or two rafts trailing, sometimes leading. Um, tagging along with us where John and Ben and the camera team uh, were on, on the rafts yeah. and with all the gear strapped down. Yeah. And so we would set up a separate camp for the kayaking and then they would set up a raft camp. But yeah. throughout the day, they'd be sort of drifting past us, leapfrogging, shooting back up river at us, shooting yeah. down river as we passed them. And how about the shots from above that they were getting? How are you guys doing that? It was really um, a logistical challenge because we would sometimes have to send, say, a raft way ahead, ahead, and then they would have to hike, yep. and it might take them an hour or two hours to scale up. Before to you the, guys could come by. Before we could come by. And, and how were you communicating that? Were you on walkies? We or? had walkie-talkies, okay. but they didn't get reception that deep. Yeah. So it was really an old-fashioned <laughs> sort of guessing game. Like, when the sun it's yep. this area over here yeah. we're it's gonna like, be like, yeah it's like, okay go get a go up that cliff over there in two hours we might be coming by right hope you get that be shot ready. <laughs> be that ready yeah yeah um power what were you doing for power for power for, we know, had um on land and in the towns we had a, a portable generator yeah and on the river we had some marine batteries with a um ac dc to ac converter so you weren't using any solar power to recharge batteries or anything? We couldn't find any solar power that would have enough juice to recharge our batteries fast enough yeah. and also being deep in the canyon. Um, this, there's just not enough sun right. down that there for sense. enough hours, and being on the river, we're constantly moving. So uh, we would we'd basically get up in the morning before dawn, shoot the sunrise, shoot all day on the river, shoot the sunset, you know, set up camp, shoot the setting up of camp, yeah. shoot the sunset to get the pretty shots, shoot the stars, and then, you know, start charging batteries somewhere around midnight or 1 a.m. and then be up 
before dawn to sh- shoot the sunrise for 30 days straight. <laughs> And I would be also be remiss if I didn't talk to you about the score. Tell me about the score because uh, I, in fact, that's how I reached out to you a few weeks ago initially to, to the interview. I said, hey, I was just in a local record store here in Portland and I came across this piece of vinyl and it was for a film called Voyages Without Trace. And lo and behold, it's the soundtrack to your film. Tell us about that. It's definitely the, the richest probably soundtrack I've ever had the experience to work yeah. with. Um, and the reason is is because we've we got to collaborate with several Portland musicians, uh, but the two primary musicians that we worked with, uh, one is Johnny Clay, and his band is the Dimes, and he uh, Johnny and I collaborated on a shorter film before this called Summer Snapshot, and so uh, somewhere around you know half the soundtrack is Johnny Clay's original compositions, wow. and that was an amazing collaboration. And the other half, approximately, is Jenny Connolly and her husband, Steve. And uh, I wanted to have sort of the American West and the American kind of the folk West background. And so Johnny was a perfect composer to do that because he's kind of in the indie folk genre. And he played uh, banjo and and acoustic guitar and... Um, we did some percussion, and he did a lot of the tr- the soundtrack that sounds sort of the Americana Aspect of it. it. And the other side, because the story involves three French explorers yeah. who come from France and come to the American West, we wanted a French element. So we um, teamed up with Jenny Connolly, who's the accordionist for the band The Decemberists. Right and is a classically trained pianist and a classically trained accordionist. And so she and her husband Steve made at least two dozen original compositions uh, in a very beautiful folk, traditional, um, French-inspired um, sound, oh, yeah. which become the the pulse of the film. And they sound like... They sound like old traditional French classics. They sound like they've always been, they've always, there's never been a time when that song hasn't existed. Yeah, you know? that's it's such a, a wonderful feeling. I, I, I would agree with that. And it's throughout, really, there's score throughout the entirety of that film in many cases. And uh, it just brings you along that journey and, and just gives you that flavor throughout. And you never really forget where you're where you are in the context of the journey and also kind of where it came from yeah you know with the with the explorers prior to you guys it's beautiful and they yeah. they took the time to not only make the um the music so beautiful for the soundtrack of the film but then they with all that beautiful heart and effort they then put it on vinyl yeah and you know went the extra mile to create a, an album that stands up in its own right as a beautiful album yeah. and um and the music just really is so so rich i sometimes think that it's as rich or even more a rich experience to actually put the vinyl on turn off all the lights yeah. and just listen to this very haunting melody yeah. of the accordion and um, i would sincerely encourage anyone yeah. to get that that on vinyl because it is just it's really the vinyl lends itself to that accordion it's, it's very old school and, yeah yeah and uh played through some big old wooden speakers it's oh just, yeah it's that's gorgeous. how i came across it it was this piece of vinyl like up in, in music millennium here in portland yeah and was like oh this is interesting and i turned it over and lo and behold there's that ian mccluskey name again. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like oh that's for his new film it's great it's great stuff uh Congratulations on a wonderful film. Congratulations on fulfilling some of your explorer um, desires and uh, becoming a, an explorer yourself, not only through this film, but in many ways with, uh, with Northwest Documentary. What can you tell my listeners in terms of where to go to see some of your films and then where can people go to find out more information on Northwest Documentary and your workshops? Sure. Our films are available on our websites and... Um they're, they should be available on Amazon. I know Summer Snapshots on iTunes. Um, the best, and this is kind of still the old old school way to do it, but if someone can still play a DVD, I encourage the DVD because we always pack them with 
um, as much bonus features as possible. Yeah. And sometimes I like the bonus features as much or more than the movies. The extras are so much fun. There's so yeah. much, I mean, for anyone who loves documentary, it's, that's where we can geek out is yeah. in the bonus, but we can, yeah, the, uh, the DVDs are available online. Okay. Um, they're pretty searchable voyages without trace, yep. eloquent nude summer snapshot. Um, and Northwest Documentary is just nwdocumentary.org. Yep. And we offer workshops year-round, and people can take the 10-week workshop and learn how to edit and shoot and make their own film. Is there anything you would like to um, add that maybe uh, I have forgotten or that you would like to say, whether it's about your films or your organizations or advice to anybody who wants to lead a documentary life? I think the you know the most inspiring thing about a documentary life is that it is about curiosity and exploration but the most profound thing about it is that it's also a responsibility and it is a very if I even dare say it it's a very sacred role in society that it is a um the responsibility of the story keepers and that means those who can draw out stories that would be silent, but then they give them back to the people who they've drawn them from, or they give them back to posterity and history at large. And in my films and in the films of all the students that come through Northwest Documentary, we always um, show them publicly, and we always show them in a theater, and we always show them with the people who are part of the film themselves. And we sit as filmmaker and subject side by side and watch the film together and it's a uh, it's a moment of giving the story back and I just think that uh, with that in mind as people go out yes it can you can travel to faraway places and you can have great experiences but it bringing films in the fullness of that circle really grounds people to that role that is important and so people who are called to documentary take heart you know take it seriously because few are, few are called, and it's not very sustainable to most, but those who are called, it is a, it's an important journey, and it's an important thing to do with one's life. Incredibly inspiring and encouraging words, Ian. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.